Orson Smith, Member of Parliament, Southampton Itchen. And uh, please, can you outline why you campaigned for Britain to leave the EU? Simple for me. I think that we are an independent, sovereign nation that has its best years still ahead of it. And lots of people voted for different reasons. Mine were really simple. I don't like the Parliament. I don't like the Commission. I don't recognise the court, the anthem or the flag. I'm British. I think Britain can stand up saying two feet and that's why I voted to leave. And are you able to explain some of the reasons you think people voted to remain? Yeah, and the same with leave. There are a hundred reasons that people voted to leave and I'm sure as many for people that voted remain. But I think one of the things that people voted remain for, and I can't speak for them all and I wouldn't even attempt to, is because it's the path of least resistance. We're already in. It isn't that bad, is it? We might just as well stay. Who knows what's going to happen if we leave? So I think a lot of Remain people voted in that way, which is why there are plenty of Remain people now that are not saying, let's have another referendum, let's do it all again. They're saying, just get on with it. We voted now. We, you gave us our chance. We did what we did, and now get on with it. So I think there's an element of that in Remain. Okay. And what sort of Brexit would you like to see executed? Well, they are our closest friends. I'll give you an example. When, uh, when the French were under attack in Paris from terrorists, the first country to step up, as always, was Britain, their closest ally, historically. And we'll continue to be like that. So they are our friends. We are not leaving Europe. We're leaving this political union, which may, many people didn't recognise and still don't. If they thought about it logically, no one asked us if we wanted to join an organisation that is top-heavy with unelected people. So what I want to see is a really close relationship, a good free trade arrangement for us so that our manufacturing and our services can cross seamless borders, but I want us to remain friends with Europe. And what do you think should happen to EU internationals currently in Britain? Simple, stay. I've always said that from the start. People that come here, make their homes here, came under a process where that was legitimate and legal, they should be allowed to stay, and if they contribute to our country, then the more of those we have, the better I like it. And what do you think, well, what sort of immigration policy would you like? I'd like an immigration policy where we bring the people that we need. Now, the problem with the free movement of people, which is one of the four pillars of the European Union, is that people can come, they can bring 20 of their family members, they can come and settle in this country whether they have a job or not, and they can come and live here whether they contribute or not. Now, any immigration policy worth its salt looks for the people that they need and one day that may be plumbers and the next day that may be brain surgeons. But what we do is we look for those people and we bring them in on merit, they contribute, they become British if they wish to and they're welcome to stay. Okay. So Philip Richmond, the organiser of the Is It Worth It bus campaign, said that each forecast of us leaving the EU leaves us worse off financially. So how, how can Brexit make sense if it weakens us? Uh, if those forecasts are correct. Let me give you an example about how forecasts work. The Treasury, very respected organisation, lots of great technical economists and buff boffins sat in there coming out with forecasts all the time. During the Leave campaign, I was addressing an audience in Salisbury, and one of the questions was that uh, the new uh, assessments from the Treasury were that by 2030 we'll all be £4,300 per year worse off. Big document, big, big heavy document. In that same month, we borrowed £1.8 billion more than we had forecast. The Treasury couldn't get 30 days right. They don't necessarily mean they can get 30 years right. So what we should do is we should look at those proposals, those projections. We should be cautious, but we should use that to say this is why we need to do big free trade deals with the US, China, South America, our Commonwealth, Africa, Middle East, there are markets for us. Now, even if those projections are right, we should be backfilling them. Okay. Uh, a large part of the, of the Is It Worth It campaign is that they are saying, they're not asking for a second referendum. What they're asking for is that the people have a say on the terms that we leave the EU on. How they do can, you feel about that? They can have their say. You're having their say now. The bus that's driving around is going to have its say. Uh, if votes. they're not asking, well that's, well, that's a referendum then. You can't have a say so a without a vote, facts. unless it's a referendum. So, but what they're asking for is a referendum on the facts. Well, you said they're not asking for a second referendum. They're asking for a second referendum. I now, Fine, but they're asking for another referendum. You know, this is typical of what the European Union has become. 
So if you look at the Irish referendum, they didn't go the right way the first time, so they had another one. This is typical. You can keep on asking the questions until you get the answer you want. What you can't do is you can't prove a negative. So we're leaving the European Union because the people were given a vote and they chose to leave. And if I was a Remainer or a Lever, I'm a Democrat. That's what we say. We don't say, we don't like your type of democracy. I'll give you an example about how this works. George Bush and Gaza. George Bush wanted democracy across the Middle East. And there's nothing wrong with that. When Hamas were elected to represent Gaza, yeah, but not that lot. Well, that's not democracy, is it? And that's exactly what this is. We've asked you the question. We told you it's an in-out referendum. We told you what the circumstances would be. We told you what the end game was. People voted and then people said, but I don't like that. Do you know what the Remain campaign now, this new campaign now is doing? They're saying that you, the people, are just not bright enough to make a decision. And they... How is that what, they, what the Remainers campaign they, is doing? Isn't, um, isn't that what... what let, you... let me finish this point. They, the people that want to do it again, think they are much brighter than the people that voted. And do you know what? Here's the thing about democracy. It doesn't matter why people vote. It's a fact that they're allowed and it's their choice. If you don't like the result, you can't go and replay it. But they're not asking on another referendum on, on whether we stay or leave. They're asking for the terms on which we leave. As in, there, there, there are no terms. There can't be, well, they're, 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 this is all a myth. Hard Brexit, soft Brexit, we're leaving. We're leaving the Commission, the Court and the Parliament. We will no longer recognise the flag or the anthem. That's it. Full stop. That's done. Done. What we're now talking about is what our relationship will be like in the future. That's a completely different thing. And do you know how you change that? You kick the government out and you put a new one in that says it's got a different way of doing things. But the leaving is what we were voting on. And we are leaving. No one's going to have a referendum on the terms of this or the terms of that. If that stacks, if that stacks then, why are they not asking for a referendum on the terms of any deal we might do with China? Or any deal we might do with Bahrain? Or Lebanon? Or the Falkland Islands? Why are they not asking for a referendum on any deal that we do with them? No, they're asking for a referendum on this one because they don't trust the public with the vote that they were given. Okay. So, so you're saying that people should trust their elected officials? That's what we're elected to. for. Okay. And that's so, the beauty of democracy, they can kick us out if they don't know what we're doing. So John Major yesterday made a speech uh, where he called for MPs to be able to vote on the, on the final terms. Free vote. Yeah. Mm. And then ultimately whether or not to call a second referendum. How do you feel about that? He said that there should be a free vote not a whipped vote. Now, a whipped vote is simple. The whips don't put a gun against your head. The whips say, this is government policy, will you be voting for it or not? And if you say no, guess what happens? Nothing. So Anna Subri and people like that, Dominic Grieve, Stephen Hammond, people that have rebelled, have they been taken out in the car park and roughed up? No. So the whipping system is not, you will do this, can work with patronage. If you want to get on, you might as well do what uh, your colleagues want you to. It's about knowing how people are going to vote, so you know what votes you can get through Parliament. Here's the rub with John Major. So John Major was a fine Prime Minister in his time. When he pushed through Maastricht, he whipped those people. And now he's saying it shouldn't be whipped. He didn't give them a free vote on Maastricht, did he? That's why there were rebels like Ian Duncan Smith and Bill Cash, because he whipped them. And do you know the irony about whipping people through Maastricht? Was Maastricht Treaty then led to the Lisbon Treaty, which probably led to this referendum. So probably what John Major did back in the 90s when he whipped people on Maastricht probably led to the referendum, the result we've got now, and the thing that he detests the most. Actually, he should look in the mirror. Okay. So Councillor Darren Paffey recently told me that the EU is a fantastic trading market and that leaving the EU may result in a huge loss of jobs in Southampton. Do you accept that statement? No. Why not? Which jobs is he talking about? He's talking about port jobs. Then. Port jobs. Does he know that 90% of all trade that goes through the port of Southampton is not the EU? 90% of all trade that goes through Dover is, but not in Southampton. Probably people like 
Dan Peffin, is that they don't know the detail. So the 950 cars that we import and export through the Port of Southampton don't go to the EU mostly. Most of the containers that you see come in from the Far East. The cruise ships which bring 450 to 500 cruise ships to the Port of Southampton aren't EU cruise ships, they are international cruise ships. So 90% of all trade through the Port of Southampton is not EU. So how will Brexit affect the people of Southampton, Itchy? Well, I think it's going to be better for them to give them opportunities. You know, what the thing about a change is, and you hear this, you'll hear this all the time, business wants certainty. Well, only business that's not very good wants certainty. Or business that has a monopoly, like the big corporations. Other businesses don't want certainty, they want disruption. They want to prove that they're good at their business. If you give them an opportunity and they are good enough, they'll take it. Now, one thing that Brexit is going to give us, because of necessity, so firstly you park the political, the reason I wanted to come out, then you have to say, how do we now make sure that we benefit from this? Well, that's a big, wide world of trading. And for good businesses, businesses that like disruption because they can survive in disruption and bad businesses will go to the wall. Businesses that haven't changed the, the way they do business, look at Woolworths now, look at Toys R Us and places like that. You need to change and adapt to the market that you're in. So I think business is going to do well. And I think as a result of that, people in Southampton are going to do better than they otherwise have been doing in the past. Some say that momentum had significant influence over the Southampton test in the last general election, causing Alan Whitehead to more than double his, his, his vote majority. Will your, th will your 31 vote majority hold if the Corbyn Easter group target Southampton Itchen next? I'm very grateful to the 31 people that made sure that I survived, but I'm more interested in the 20 odd thousand that voted for me. They're the people that sent me here to do this job, and they're the ones that I represent. Now, I represent everyone as their MP because that's the job, but I don't fixate on the 31. I'm more concerned about the 20 odd thousand, which incidentally is the biggest vote share that Conservatives have ever had in Southampton Itchen since the borders were drawn up in 1950. It's the only time that we've ever, uh, in a fair, straight fight with Labour, won in the way that we have. There was 93% of the vote was shared just between Labour and the Conservatives. So I'm not fixated on the 31. I'm more concerned about representing the 20 odd thousand that voted for me. What about the, the 50,000 people in Southampton as a whole that, that voted to remain? How do you, as a, as a known Brexiteer, how do you uh, not alienate them? Yeah, that's a good point. I've been saying that all the time. You know, in my constituency of Southampton, Itchin, 60% of people voted to leave. Now, that is a coincidence, if you like. I happen to be someone that wanted to leave. I'm not, I'm not a, an extreme Brexiteer. I just, you know, court, commission, parliament, that's my thing. Um, but it just so happened that more of my constituents voted to leave than voted to remain. Uh, however, and the point that I've made all the way through, right through from prime ministerial down, is that we now are representing the people that voted to leave because the Leave campaign uh, were victorious in that particular referendum. Our job is to make sure that we bring as many Remainers with us as we can. Some of them just won't. Tony Blair, John Major, Alistair Campbell, you can never reconcile these people. They feel like they have been personally uh, slighted by people that uh, have, a, have a, a different view to them. There's not much we can do about that. But the people that, as I said to you, that are ambivalent, that said, I would rather remain, but I vote, uh, but we've now voted to leave. Those are the people we need to convince. We need to work very hard to get them to understand what the process is going forward. And we need to make the best job of Brexit for them as much as for the people that voted to leave. Great. Well done. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you, Roston. It's oh. my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> oh.